Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark Dirks, and on behalf of ACRL and Choice, I'd like to welcome you to today's program, The Power of Partnership, Digital Collections for Academic Consortium, which is sponsored by Overdrive. Today's discussion is one in a series of sponsored webinars from ACRL and Choice that addresses new ideas, developments, and products of interest to the academic library community. Free to users, these structured 60-minute live presentations allow uh, for the opportunity for interactive discussions of important new issues and developments in academic librarianship by librarians, vendors, authors, and other interested stakeholders. Before we get started, I'd like to point out a few features of the webinar software. In the main area of the screen, you can follow along with the presentation materials. Along the right-hand side, you should see a Q&A panel and a chat panel. If you don't see them there, you can click the button um, across the bottom of your screen that sort of looks like a little dialogue cloud to open up the chat panel. Um, and if you're looking for the Q&A, that should be under the three dots uh, along the bottom of your screen too. So if you have questions for our speakers, use, please use the Q&A panel to submit them um, at the end of the presentation. They will take a few minutes to answer your questions, so please do send them in throughout. If you're having any technical issues, please use the chat panel to let me know, and I will troubleshoot the issue with you privately. Today, uh, we're using the hashtag ACRLChoiceWebinars uh, during the event, so please feel free to shout, at, uh, shout out at us. We are at choice underscore reviews on Twitter. Also note that we are recording today's program and everyone who registered should receive a, an email with a direct link to the archived version. All right, our speakers today are um, Christina Verdon, Jeff Bruner, and Lindsay Levinson. Christina Verdon is the e-resources coordinator at Mobius. Jeff Bruner is a community liaison service uh, specialist for Wills. And Lindsay Levinson is an account manager at Overdrive, working with academic, corporate, and special libraries. With that, we are ready to get started, I believe. So I will pass the ball over to you, Christina. Okay, hi everyone. Um, just to give you a little bit of background on me, I am Christina Verdon and I manage group electronic purchasing for the Mobius Consortium. Uh, Mobius is a library consortium that is based in Missouri but is now growing to include members in other states. So we're a multi-type organization, meaning we have academic, public, and special libraries among our membership. But the majority of our members are academic. Um, among our academic members, we also have a great deal of diversity in institution types. We have large research institutions, public and private colleges, um, large and small universities, community colleges, and a number of seminary, religious, and specialized schools. We are a resource sharing organization supporting and facilitating cost-effective sharing of library materials and services through our shared ILS services, our union catalog, our courier network, and our electronic resources program. So that's just a little bit about us. So the more important question is how did we kind of get started with OverDrive? Um, I'll warn you, it's not the most glamorous story, but this is how most consortial offers tend to start out. Um, a director at one of our member libraries contacted me after seeing an email blast about K-12 through shared OverDrive collections and wondered if it was a possibility for academics. And I said, I'll contact OverDrive and find out. And very quickly after that, we started working on putting together an OverDrive offer for our membership. Our timeline from the initial offer that we put out to the members to our official go live took about eight months and it spanned four seasons. Um, the initial inquiry um, to OverDrive was made in May of 2017 and by late June we had an offer that was ready to send out. Um, the offer required that we get five new customers on board and allowed members who already had OverDrive collections to participate once we hit that five new customer threshold. Um, feedback on the offer was generally positive and we, re we received a lot of requests for quotes during that time period and a lot of questions 
on how something like a shared collection would work. Um, so we spent the bulk of the summer kind of answering those questions and continually reaching out to the membership to see who remained interested. Um, we asked for final commitments on the offer by August 11th, 2017, and ended up needing to extend that deadline a bit, but we did secure a fifth member by the beginning of September. Um, the fall period was spent working out all of the details, building our site, setting up our authentication, attending training, making all of the group settings decisions that needed to be made. And then we officially went live during the winter holidays um, just after Christmas. Our biggest early challenge um, during the offer period was getting that five required participants on board. Um, as I mentioned before, feedback was positive and there were a lot of inquiries and requests for pricing, um, but there was also a lot of uncertainty. Um, libraries thought this was an interesting and a really good idea, but they weren't sure if it was for them or they weren't able to commit funds at that time for budget reasons. There were also a lot of questions about how shared purchasing would work. Um, what kind of freedom they would have in a shared purchasing environment, how many titles the group would realistically have access to, were there going to be enough titles within that that would be relevant to their users. Um, all of these concerns were really understandable. It was something new. Um, budgets can be difficult in the state of Missouri and all over, as you know, for libraries. Um, and it's something that would require staff time to manage. Um, so what I think helped us get that initial five members on board was having libraries in the consortium who were already using OverDrive and were enthusiastic about it. We had three of those. Um, they were willing to answer questions about OverDrive. And even if members never actually contacted those libraries, we could kind of point to their collections and talk about them as libraries who were having success with OverDrive and that it was you know, something that was working for them on their campuses. Um, the second thing that I think really helped us was just the responsiveness of the OverDrive team. Um, Members had a lot of questions and they answered them in a very timely manner. Um, and that allowed me to make sure that members had all of the information they needed to give the offer serious consideration very quickly, which I think was reassuring for a lot of our members. So once we got our five in place, our original pilot group um, consisted of eight libraries. Um, on this slide, you can see the five original libraries we had, and then marked with stars are the ones that had existing um, OverDrive collections that joined us. Um, and you can see how many titles they each had in their existing OverDrive collections. So we had a good group, a good mix of sized institutions as well to kind of get started with. The members of that pilot group had a variety of different reasons for joining the shared collection. Um, there was interest in having a collection that was available 24-7 and easy to use across a variety of devices. Um, OverDrive is very user-friendly, and for many students and faculty, it was something they were already comfortable with and understood how to use from their public libraries. Uh, there was interest in providing students and faculty with electronic access to more popular content. We have a number of ebook collections that we offer access to um, through our discount program, but it tends to focus more on academic content. This was a way to offer more popular content. And some schools were interested in that popular content for academic reasons, and for others, they really wanted to provide a way to support recreational reading for students and faculty. Um, being able to provide more audio content was a big factor for a number of schools that were participating. And lastly, participating in the shared collection was something that was affordable for a lot of these schools. They might not have been able to offer OverDrive if they had to go it alone on an individual contract, but doing it as a shared group was a much more affordable and realistic option for them. Another one of the early challenges that we faced um, during the setup period involved deciding how to manage selection in a shared environment. After several meetings and online discussions with the pilot group, we developed a collection development standards document. Um, this is viewable on the Mobius website. Um, you're welcome to take a look at it. Um, if you do take a look at it, you'll notice that the standards are rather loosely defined, and this was done intentionally for a couple of reasons. Um, one was to maximize each library's ability to select titles that are appropriate for their own patrons. Um, the other was to allow for diversity within the shared collection. One of the strengths of the Mobius print resource sharing program is the diversity of the membership and the access to very unique collections that comes with that. Um, so 
basically we're trying to kind of replicate that within the overdrive group, allowing for maximum freedom and allowing for diversity to kind of develop naturally by keeping the standards flexible. So the joke kind of running through this is that they're more like guidelines than actual rules. None of it's set in stone, but there are some parameters that we are asking people to follow as they choose collections or choose titles for the collection. So some of the key principles that are outlined in that document are that each school decides how to spend their portion of the shared content credit independently of the other schools. Um, they aren't working together to develop lists of titles to purchase and they aren't approving each other's purchase. Everybody has the kind of freedom to pick the titles that they want. There's a strong preference for one copy, one user titles rather than metered titles, but there is recognition that sometimes purchasing metered titles is desirable and makes sense. For example, the Harry Potter titles. Um, the members have agreed to avoid duplication of titles wherever possible to ensure that the collection has the maximum number of titles that it can. Um, but duplication in different formats is okay. So it, it's quite all right to have an ebook and an audiobook version of the same title. The group has agreed that they're only going to collect ebooks and audiobooks at this time. And the e resources co e coordinator, who is me, serves as the gatekeeper. Um, for purchasing. And what that really means is that after a member creates a card of materials, I make sure there aren't duplicates. Um, I make sure the member still has enough content credit to make the purchase, and I go ahead and make the purchase on their behalf. And I also serve as the billing agent for the contract. Um, now that the group's more comfortable with purchasing and kind of getting used to sharing, um, I think that they'll be able to, this, this is something that might change, and they might be able to kind of manage purchasing on their own. The document also governs the use of Advantage accounts by the members. Um, Advantage accounts are overdrive accounts that allow members to purchase additional content that is outside of the shared collection um, purchased separately. So it gives them even more freedom to purchase things that don't necessarily meet the criteria of the shared collection guidelines. Um, generally, members are kind of using their Advantage um, accounts in a number of different ways. Um, most of them are using it once their portion of the shared content credit runs out. They're using it to purchase materials they want their members to have priority access to or that they want to retain individually. The big thing for the Mobius group with the Advantage um, accounts is that all members have agreed to make the content that they own through Advantage available to the entire group using the consortial sharing features that are in Advantage. Um, this is increasing the number of titles that each member has access to by sharing everything. So that was sort of our how things got started and how the collection came to be story. Um, so now I'm going to talk about the things that have happened since our initial go live period. The big thing that's happened for us is growth. We've added nine new libraries since our initial launch. Um, you can see the list of libraries here along with the dates that they signed their contract. Um, those that have an asterisk by their name are ones that are still working on their implementation right now. So we've, we're up to 17 libraries now from our original eight, which in a very short period of time we thought was fantastic. The next thing, big thing that happened was usage. Um, the collection's growing and people are using it. These stats are from earlier in the month when I made this slide. Um, we've since reached 6,000 checkouts on September 23rd. Um, and at the time I made this slide, we were also providing access to 11,128 total titles through the shared purchasing, the sharing of the Advantage content, and the addition of the Project Gutenberg titles to the collection. So it's a pretty robust collection. And there are there have been some purchases made since I've made this slide, so things have grown it a little bit more. So we've been really happy with the growth and usage that we've seen in just a short time of being live. Um, and we feel like this has been a really successful project for Mobius. So with that, I kind of want to talk about some of the things that I think contributed to our success as a consortium. 
The first thing is promotion. Um, we've done a great deal of promotion since Go Live at both the individual library level and at the consortium level. Our members are promoting heavily within their libraries using a variety of methods. They're doing workshops, they're um, creating bookmarks and email blasts, and they're using social media. So they're promoting very heavily at the ground level. And then at the consortium level, we've submitted articles to our local library association newsletters. We're promoting through our own website, newsfeed, and discussion lists. We've we put on an annual conference every year in June, and a group of participants did a wonderful presentation on the shared collection at that conference. Um, we mentioned the Academic Overdrive Collection when we're in discussions with potential new Mobius members. Um, I'm doing this presentation today. Um, so we're working hard to make users and other Mobius members aware that this is something that we offer, and we think that's paying off tremendously. Um, each time we add a new member, the collection gets larger and more diverse, and the benefits grow for everyone. So it's a great opportunity for our members to be able to offer something like this. The second big factor in our success, and possibly the biggest in my opinion, um, is the advantage sharing that took place before our pilot group of libraries went live. Uh, the three members of that pilot group who had OverDrive collections shared, um, shared their content with the entire group. So they made all of that content that they already owned available to the entire consortium. Um, and this offered us several very key advantages. Um, we started out with a well-developed collection of, a, of thousands of titles on day one, rather than the much smaller collection we would have started out with if we had just started through consortial purchasing. Um, also, because of this, the group was under much less pressure to quickly develop a collection before Go Live. This allowed them to spend their content credit more carefully and over a larger period of time. Um, the robustness of the collection was attractive to faculty and students, which I think helped drove usage. Um, it was also attractive to new members who had previously been on the fence about joining. They could kind of see what they were going to have access to and how broad and diverse the collection was. So I think that helped a lot of them make the decision to jump in with us on this. So overall, things have been going very well for us with the OverDrive Shared Collection, but we did face a couple of challenges after Go Live. Um, one of our big challenges was Mark Records. Um, the group had initially wanted to purchase higher quality records together as a group, and that led to a lot of questions. Um, for example, how should the purchases be coordinated? How do we figure out who's paying for what? How often do we bill for records? Billing every time a purchase is made is pretty difficult from a consortial billing standpoint because sometimes a purchase is just one or two books. Um, how do we handle records that would be coming from multiple sources? Because members are purchasing through the shared account and they're purchasing through their Advantage accounts, but they're sharing everything with the entire consortium, we do have records that are coming in from multiple places. So making sure we have a complete set of records has been a little bit tricky. Um, we've also had a lot of discussions about how to get records that had already been purchased by some of our members before we formed the shared collection um, to be able to be used by the entire group. Um, so we kind of are still ironing out a lot of these questions and figuring things out. So what we've decided to do in the meantime is load the freely available OverDrive um, mark records for each of our libraries. Um, and this is something that we're going to kind of keep revisiting as time goes on. And maybe it will be the subject of another presentation that we'll do on OverDrive down the road. So to kind of sum things up, I just want to highlight some of the challenges that I think we're going to face in the future with this collection. Um, I think managing purchasing is going to be something that we'll have to figure out in the future. Should I continue to sort of be the gatekeeper for this collection, or will we move to a system where members can purchase within the shared collection on their own without going through me? As we get more and more members, um, purchasing through one person could get difficult to manage. It works pretty well now. Uh, but many of the recent additions to the collection haven't made any purchases yet. So we'll kind of see how things go with that. Um, we need to ensure that the collection development standards document stays current and meets our needs. Um, we don't have a process in place for reviewing that now, but it's something we may need to look at adding into the future. Um, our initial setup decisions were made by our pilot group, but we now have nine additional members and hopefully we'll have many more. 
um, they may have new ideas or suggestions for changes to the way we kind of have things set up and how do we incorporate their ideas and make sure that we're constantly making sure this collection is working for everybody that's participating. Um, keeping the collection discoverable is another big issue and that goes back to that MARC records discussion that I just mentioned on the last slide. Um, how do we improve the MARC records we have? How do we ensure that we're getting complete record sets loaded for each individual member? Especially where we have this complicated purchasing structure where people are purchasing both individually and consortially. Um, so we have some things to think about for the future, but overall we've been really pleased with this Overdrive Shared Collection. I think it's added a lot of value for our member libraries and we hope to see it grow and flourish in the future. Um, so with that, I wanna say thank you all for your time. I'm letting me tell you a little bit about how our shared collection developed and I will turn things over to Jeff from Will. Hello, <laughs> uh, good afternoon. Um, thank you so much to ACRL and Choice uh, and Overdrive for having me on today. My name is Jeff Bruner. Uh, I'm a librarian and staff member with WILLS, the statewide multi-type library consortium in Wisconsin. I'm excited to talk to you today about our new Academic Library Shared eBook collection. Um, our collection is actually much newer than that of uh, Mobius. Um, I'm actually uh, furiously uh, scribbling down notes from Christina's talk uh, to uh, think about how we can implement some of the things they've been doing with our group. Um, so we're a lot earlier in our process uh, than, than they are. But I'm happy to talk about where we are uh, and uh, where we're going uh, in the future. So first I'll tell you a little bit about uh, our consortium. Um, Wills was founded in 1970 as the Wisconsin Library Service. Um, the original goals were to provide cooperative interlibrary loan service and investigations into development of a statewide union list of serials. Um, our first participants were the University of Wisconsin system and several private Wisconsin colleges. Over that next decade, Wills would expand and merge with some other nascent organizations and develop a long-term relationship with OCLC. Uh, during the 1980s, Wills expanded its service areas, particularly cooperative purchasing, which is um, how we refer to kind of group or consortial purchasing. We developed partnerships with library resource vendors of all kinds, securing discounted pricing on the resources our members need uh, to best serve their users. The expansion of these services drew much more attention to Wills and led to considerable increases in our membership. In the years since then, Wills continued to expand its services, uh, reach out to new members, and began hosting our annual Wills World uh, Library and Technology and Innovation Conference. Uh, in 2012, two significant changes took place. Um, first, OCLC changed how they work with local or regional consortia. That led to uh, a fairly significant change in, in our revenue model. Um, and second, that same year, the University of Wisconsin determined to separate all 501c3 organizations like Wills from the university. So those changes really made it critical that Wills undertake a major reorganization process. So we got out of the interlibrary loan business entirely, uh, moved out of the UW library offices and trimmed down the staff. We shifted our services, focusing uh, much more on the cooperative purchasing service, um, some consulting and consortium management services that we offer as well. So today, Wills has uh, over 600 member libraries, virtually every branch public library in Wisconsin, uh, virtually every academic library, virtually every uh, school or, or K-12 library are members. Um, we offer a wide range of cooperative and group purchasing options and serve as the consortium managers for several other smaller groups of Wisconsin libraries of all kinds. And among those um, smaller consortia that we help to manage are the Wisconsin Public Library Consortium and the Wisconsin Schools Digital Library Consortium. Both of those are buying pools 12 libraries respectively 
for the purpose of developing shared ebook collections. Both of those collections have been wildly successful, providing ebook access via Overdrive to every public library card holder um, in the state and uh, a large and growing number of school children uh, in Wisconsin through their school library. So those successful programs really are guiding our progress on this new academic library ebook collection, uh, which I'm talking about today. So uh, how did we get started? Well, at the end of 2017, uh, one of our members, the Chippewa Valley Technical College, contacted me to ask about Overdrive as a potential vendor of ebooks for their students and staff. We talked a bit about the options already available to their personnel um, via the public library collection that I mentioned earlier. And though every student and staff member at the college had access to that public library collection, um, the library really wanted to be able to curate its own collection tailored to their needs. So I reached out to uh, Rob Rando at Overdrive to talk about um, options that we might be able to present uh, to the college. We talked about some of the standalone pricing uh, for the college to, to start their own collection and about shared collections. So in discussion with the library, we decided that the best course of action would be to try to develop a shared collection of ebooks specifically for Wisconsin's academic libraries. So the concept was simple, um, a shared ebook collection focusing on the needs of Wisconsin academic libraries. With enough participation, we didn't think it would be hard to build a substantial collection that would give each library access to many more books than they'd be able to afford on their own. And the keys to making this a success uh, would be good pricing <laughs> and hard work uh, recruiting libraries. As with most collaborative endeavors, the more participants we could attract, the better the collection would be. So Rob and I worked together to develop a pricing grid and a discount level that we thought would be appealing to Will's members. Um, and the pricing model is, is tiered based on institutional FTE. It provides for a sizable discount for libraries that commit to, uh, to the three-year term. So a portion of each member fee goes towards hosting costs, but the rest is used to purchase content. Uh, Wills actually also charges a, a small service fee that's in line with how we handle the rest of our cooperative purchasing uh, deals for our members. So Rob and I agreed that we'd have to reach a threshold. I think um, Christina mentioned that as well. We, we also landed on a five library threshold of participation uh, in order to make it worthwhile for Overdrive and for the members. So we had a great offer in hand, um, but I wanted to gauge interest from our members just uh, as to how popular such a collection would be. Um, as I said, it's critical to get to that minimum level of participation to make the whole endeavor work. And Wills wanted to make sure that we were headed in the right direction. And when we've got those kinds of questions, um, you know, we talk to our members. <laughs> so I put together a short survey. Uh, it was really only four questions, but uh, the questions were designed to get a sense of what, if any, support there would be for a large shared collection. If we didn't think there was enough interest, we could always just do a standalone co collection just for Chippewa Valley, uh, the original um, requesting library. So the survey's results came in quickly. Um, they made it clear that there was definitely enough interest among academic library members to support a shared ebook collection. For the most part, survey respondents were most interested in a collection that contained primarily academic content, but um, there was also some support and interest for a mix of both scholarly and popular content. So I felt confident that we'd be able to reach the five library threshold that we'd previously agreed to. We started a promotion and outreach campaign um, almost immediately. Uh, Overdrive hosted an informational webinar talking about the platform and the collection building model. Rob uh, did a great job of laying out all the benefits of the program, emphasizing its collaborative nature and Overdrive's um, ease of use for uh, the end user patron. After that, uh, he and I developed a follow-up strategy. The goal was to reach out to all Will's academic library members, but we thought it made the most sense to tailor our messages based on webinar participation 
and um, stated interest. So we developed three lists, uh, those libraries that had attended the webinar, those who hadn't uh, attended but who had shown interest in the initial survey, and those who'd never responded to any previous messaging at all. Um, and then I, I kind of crafted and sent out tailored emails to each of those groups, including recordings of the webinar that, that uh, Overdrive had hosted, and invited them to contact me or Rob to talk about the collection, answer questions, and uh, if appropriate, get them a price quote. So after the email campaign, um, Rob and I divided up the list of libraries based on uh, who'd spoken to whom. You know, some folks had reached out to Rob with questions, some to me. So we sort of uh, just put our heads together to talk about, uh, like, you know, what conversations were already going on to, to best um, uh, kind of strategically approach uh, follow-up calls and emails. Um, it didn't take very long to get uh, to, the, uh, to the five library limit. Um, and once we were at five, then you know, I said I, I did one kind of last big push to all of the academic library members um, announcing that you know, we, we had passed the threshold, so the group was definitely going to happen. Um, and any library that might have been waiting uh, for that point, you know, who didn't want to be the first uh, to commit, um, if they were interested, now would be the time. Um, so, in the end, uh, after that kind of recruitment phase, we also ended up with eight libraries as our starting point, uh, much like Mobius did. So we have eight libraries. Um, that group is comprised of seven technical colleges. Uh, in Wisconsin, we call them technical colleges. They, you know, you might think of them as trade schools. Um, uh, it's a, essentially a two-year kind of um, uh, institution. And one of the eight is uh, one of the uh, comprehensive four-year public universities here in Wisconsin. In total, they'll have almost $20,000 to spend on the collection in each of the three years of the initial term. And the work we're doing right now is in organizing the group and starting the process of making joint decisions. So uh, we had to establish a key person at each library so that we you know, had a, a specific list of whom to talk to at, at each institution. Um, and then we have started the process of gathering uh, decisions from the group on the initial website settings uh, for the collection page. Um, after that, we'll start the work of developing the collection of it itself. Lindsay uh, from Overdrive, who is actually uh, going to be speaking after me, I think, um, is our account manager, and she's already proven to be invaluable in getting going on those processes. She hosted another web meeting uh, specifically for the participating libraries. Um, she went over the process of uh, kind of going over all those startup steps that we would need to do, um, gave us a nice overview of the marketplace and, and the interface that members will be using to um, develop the collection. Um, and uh, so, <laughs> sorry. Um, so I've been kind of doing that work of getting the initial settings from members, primarily via just email, um, to get input from members on things like the color scheme for the collection website and the, what the URL will be and so forth. Um, but once we are, uh, once we've got working on the collection development process itself, we'll probably use some other tools like Google Forms um, to uh, facilitate some of that. Um, I do expect that the collection will be comprised largely of nonfiction academic material supporting the various technical and occupational training missions uh, that most of our members have. But I also expect that they'd like to have some fiction and popular literature as well, certainly the initial survey. Uh, so I would expect that this group um, would be interested in some of that too. Several members are excited to also have their own um, Advantage accounts in addition to the shared collection. Um, so uh, while they're 
really pleased to be contributing to a large shared collection. Uh, almost every member, uh, as part of the process of getting them on board, asked and, and wanted to confirm that they'd also be able to put more money in uh, to their own uh, accounts to get collections that would be available just for their own uh, students and, and faculty and staff as well. And um, at, at, just like uh, Christina mentioned uh, at Mobius, one member library already had an OverDrive account, um, and they're going to be donating much of their existing collection into our new collection uh, as well. So uh, it will be a challenge to get all of these libraries moving in the same direction on joint decisions. Um, everyone is busy, especially at the beginning of a semester, but um, as I mentioned, we, Wills has a lot of experience in facilitating these sorts of collaborations, uh, large-scale ebook collaborations in specific. <laughs> so I'm confident that we're going to end up with an exciting and well-used collection um, that fills an important niche for each of our members. So um, with that, I think I uh, have come to the end of my slides, so I will kind of pass the baton over to Lindsay. All right. Thank you, Jeff. So um, I am, uh, I've worked with both Jeff and Christina to get their um, collections up and running. And I actually think, Mark, I'm not able to control the slides if you can go ahead and move slides for me. Okay, there we go. So um, benefits of an e-reading platform. You heard from Jeff and Christina about their process, the, what they went through in order to get a consortium together and set it up. Um, so I've been happy to work with both of them. Talk about some of the unique features that we have in an OverDrive platform. The benefits of an e-reading platform is accessibility. So we have uh, two apps, both the OverDrive app as well as the Libby app that students could use. It's an easy platform, easy process. Um, compatible against a lot of different devices. It promotes recreational reading as well as academic materials. I have a lot of my college accounts that purchase popular history and sociological and psychology types of content that are both for pleasure reading as well as learning purposes. You can customize the collection for your university needs and your eBooks and audiobooks are together on one single platform. So we have a pretty large academic partner network, and what's great is I get to work with all types of academic organizations. So I have community colleges, large universities, technical schools, um, Brigham Young, who has multiple campuses, um, and this is all over the world. So I deal with all of the academic partners we have globally. So again, multiple platforms, uh, multiple formats on one platform. You can have eBooks, audiobooks, streaming video and magazines. So magazines is something that we just started to introduce that are available. Um, these are simultaneous use. So I'm going to jump back in here talking about some of the site options that we have for, for a site once you go through the process, you become an OverDrive member, and then it gets to the fun part where you get to pick out some site options. One of the great things we have is a multilingual interface. So you can choose a couple of different languages um, that a user can change the interface to that language. It's a little option here that you would see up in the top right-hand corner. Another great feature which um, our, our accounts love is the recommend to library feature. And what this is is it exposes hundreds of thousands of titles that are available if a user searches for a title and it is not available in your collection, um, but it is available for purchase from us, they can make a recommendation to purchase that title. What happens then is those recommendations appear in your marketplace. Marketplace is the back end for you managing this collection. And you can go ahead and choose to purchase those titles. If you do purchase a recommended title, the user who recommended it will be first in line to be able to check that title out. So that's a great option to allow users to have some of their own feedback and guide your purchasing decisions. Some other 
great features would be content curation. So it's really great if you purchase all these titles for your collection, but you want to organize them how, however you'd like to, what makes sense for your institution. So you have the ability to curate your whole site with the content that you have. Tri-C is a local community college for us and they purchased a very sizable collection but wanted to organize it based around certain programs that they have, certain subjects. So we did a full site curation for them and they separated everything out by arts and education, business and technology, history and law. And then within each of those headings, they created separate collections. So it's a okay. So talking about local content, as I said, you can add local content to your collection. So if you own the rights to an ebook, audiobook, or video title, whether it be course material or something that is related to your institution, you can add it to your collection and default at 50 copies of, of that title. And this is all included in your hosting and services fees. This is not an extra, extra fee to do these features. So something else, talk about MARC records and integration. We do offer MARC records, paid records through OCLC or eBibliophile, but then we also offer Overdrive MARC Express records. And Christina mentioned this before, these are minimum bib records that are uploaded to our marketplace the day after you purchase a title. So you can go in and grab those records, you can edit them and then upload them into your catalog. APIs, we also have API integration. This allows um, API integration to per checkout, holds patron information, library accounts. So we work with a lot of third-party applications to offer these APIs. So marketing materials. Once you become a partner of Overdrive, we work through getting your site set up and we also offer free marketing materials. This is all included in your service. We customize them. You can request certain, certain things, but we do have flyers, web graphics, how-to guides. We can do something customized for you. So this is all included to help spread the word about the collection and help you market it to your faculty and students. And technical assistance. So we have a really robust catalog of help articles that helps your staff. Um, they would be the front line for any support questions, but our help page is really great. You can start off by selecting the device or looking at a category or format to take a look at what an issue may be. And then of course, if there's anything um, going on that, that you can't solve, you can get it directly either to me or to our technical support team and we have a really quick turnaround to try, try to help solve those issues. Some other more par partner some more support things that we offer, all included in your service, collection development assistance. So I have a background in collection development. I can help you build carts, take a look at what would be popular, take a look at what other academic libraries on our network are seeing popularity and usage of, and then staff training. So always here to provide any sort of staff training. Once we do a kickoff, I help with marketplace, help provide some training resources for you. So a lot of things that are available once you're a partner of OverDrive. And so that concludes my kind of talk about our features, um, things that you have access to when you become a partner of OverDrive. So I'm gonna open it up to questions. Um, if anybody has any questions about the consortium or a part, being a partner of OverDrive, some of the specifics about some of the features we offer. Great, and this is Mark from ACRL and Choice. Um, it looks like we already have quite a few questions in the hopper. Um, I would encourage folks, if you do have additional questions that you'd like to um, put to any of the panelists, please drop those in the Q&A box and we'll get to as many of those as we have time for. Um, so I think the first question that we got um, a little while ago was, uh, when you say only collecting eBooks and audiobooks at, that, at this time, what other types of digital content uh, could someone get through OverDrive? And I, I would put that to perhaps Christina. Um, do you want to take a stab at that one? Sure. Um, there is video content available and um, magazine content available, as Lindsay had just mentioned, and she can probably tell you more about um, what's actually available within that. 
um, our members um, have decided to just focus on ebooks and audiobooks for now, um, and they might reevaluate. The magazine content is relatively new, and the video content, um, they just weren't interested in. They had video content from other sources, so they wanted to have their Overdrive collection focus more on ebooks and audio, more audio than anything. But I think Lindsay can talk a little bit more about magazines and what's available. Yeah, so ebooks and audiobooks are, are for sure our, our most popular formats. Some academic institutions have decided to take a look at some of the video options as well. Those are some of those are available in the simultaneous use plan so you could sign up for packages of videos. And magazines is the they're the latest format that we have. So it's pretty new, um, but we do have about a hundred magazines that are available. So some academic institutions are evaluating um, the magazine offering and potentially looking to add that to their collection as well. Great, great. Um, another question here we have uh, simply says, for those uh, having difficulty getting usage out of their digital collections, do you have any out-of-the-box recommendations for how to promote it to students and faculty um, and some of the promotional material? Um, I, I know you'd mentioned some of the things that are available through OverDrive. Um, so I, I would ask uh, maybe Christina and Jeff, do you have what, what has been your experience um, in using those promotional materials? Have, have you had the opportunity to do so? We're not at that stage yet. At at will, so I'm, I'm hoping Christina has something good to offer on that. <laughs> so I don't use them personally, but I know that um, Mobius members are using them. Um, I can try to share with anybody who's interested the presentation slides that we did, that we used for our Mobius conference presentation, because we went into a lot more detail on promotion hmm. there. Um, Overdrive has a lot of sort of ready-made social media posts that can be modified and used, and that's something that our members are using very heavily. Um, yeah. Workshops um, on campuses to help set up devices um, for faculty and students has been very helpful. I know they're incorporating um, the marketing materials into their bibliographic instruction sessions. Um, so I do think that they are finding those um, hmm. materials to be very useful. Great, great. Um, so we've got a question here from uh, Susan for both Christina and Jeff. Um, in a shared collection, how are statistics determined for indiv individual institutions when the quote unquote use is cumulative of all use across the consortia or how is individual use determined? The OverDrive portal, um, the statistics portal is very well developed and you can actually drill down to your individual library's hmm. usage so each member can go in and they can see, you know, how the collection is actually being used on their campus as well as consortially. So the, the statistics feature does allow you to really drill down to the library level. Okay, great. Um, and it looks like we've got couple more questions here. Um, one from William that says, to, to clarify, is there a separate access process or step for OverDrive so it can be seamlessly integrated into a library catalog? Uh, for example, is there immediate search and discovery followed by access? Um, and maybe Lindsay, could you speak to that? Sure. Yeah. So. Um all the partners uh, use the MARC record, so that is discoverability feature. And if we have the ability to uh, integrate using APIs, that, that works as well. They will be able to um, discover and then check out and use right from your catalog, depending upon who your catalog vendor is. But a lot of the vendors we do work with to offer those APIs. Okay, great. Um... All right, we've got a question coming through from Pam, and Pam asks, uh, can these magazines be browsed? Would it be possible to only have a subscription to the magazines if that was what a, a library was looking for? Yeah, it certainly is possible if uh, a, an institution just wanted to have magazines in their collection, that that's possible. The site is built the same way, it's the same process, and it would just be magazines uh, available on your site uh, in your collection. Hmm. Okay. 
Um, and we've got a question here uh, from Heather for Christina. And Heather asks, when you were developing your selection guidelines, were there models you found helpful for balancing the concerns about shared versus individual needs? Um, and the question perhaps, will there be enough relevant material for us? Seems to be a, a barrier for some folks, she adds. What, what are your thoughts on that, on the selection guidelines and models? I think where we really balanced that was in allowing members to spend their individual portions of the content credit the way that they wanted to. I think that allowed them a lot of freedom and made them feel like they could make choices that worked for their campus without needing permission to do so or without having to clear it through others. So I think allowing them to spend the way they wanted to um, was very helpful. We did, um, one of our members had attended an overdrive conference and there was a best practices presentation at that conference, so he shared the slides from those. Um, they helped us to form some guidelines, but I think keeping things loose hmm. was kind of what made that work for us um, in terms of, and really explaining to members how they could use their Advantage accounts to make sure that, you know, they are all sharing their content through Advantage, but one of the features of Advantage is that their patrons get priority on hold for those materials, so that was another way they could bring in more content that was relevant to their patrons and that they hmm. could be sure that their patrons would be able to access easily. Okay, great. Um, so to, to deal with a question that you have uh, sort of already answered via text, but to, to make sure that it gets into the, the recording, uh, Christina, are you, lo are you loading the MARC records at the consortial office or who does that? We do load them at the consortial office. Um, we host and manage III systems for our member libraries, so we provide their um, help desk support. So I don't load them. Our help desk team um, is fantastic, and they um, assist our members with the record load. Great. Great. Thank you. All right. And as we're coming up on the end of our time today, I would uh, mention to folks, if you have any last-minute questions for any of our speakers, now would be a great time to drop them in um, to either the chat or the Q&A box, preferably the Q&A box. Um, and we'll give you just a moment to do that here. I would also mention that um, in the chat box, you should be seeing now a link to our post-webinar survey. Please do go uh, take that and let us know how we did today. Um, your input helps us shape these presentations and helps um, keep this program going strong. So please do take a moment to, to let us know what you thought of the presentation today. All right, and I'll take a quick look at the Q&A here. Um, let's see if we've gotten any additional questions. All right. Good question from, from Heather. Are uh, the panelists willing to be contacted for follow-up questions? And I think the, the answer to that is probably yes, but I'll let each of you <laughs> speak for yourselves. For sure. Yeah, please absolutely. do. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. If anybody has any questions on the ins and outs of the process or how, how we onboard new accounts or working together best practices, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, my email address is listed there. Great. All right. Well, we're coming up on the end of our, our time, so I will say thank you to Christina and to Jeff and to you, Lindsay, as well. Um, thanks for taking the time to speak with us today um, and talk to us about uh, the Overdrive platform and using it uh, as part of a consortia. It's very interesting. Um, I'd also just mention to our viewers one more time that we did record today's program. So be on the lookout for a follow-up email from ACRL and Choice with a link to the recording. Um, and as I mentioned before, please take a moment to fill out a brief five-question survey. It shouldn't take you more than a minute or two. Um, and thank you to all of you out there for taking some time to uh, participate with us today. I hope you enjoyed the session, and I hope the rest of your day is great.